You wonder why for some math problems, people will claim that sine of x equals x? I mean, really, come on, making a curve equal a line? Well, maybe they're onto something, and I'm going to approach this question using a method known as finding the Taylor series of a function. Maybe you've seen this before, but for any function f, what I can do is I can center it at a point. For that point, we're going to let x be a constant, which we'll call a, and for any function f, its Taylor series centered at a can be rewritten as this. The first term of the series is simply evaluating f at a. The next term is taking the derivative function for f, plugging in a for that, and multiplying the result by x minus a. And then for the following terms, notice that we start introducing x minus a to a higher power by 1 as you take each term out. And then for the denominator, the factorial keeps increasing, right? And so this is infinitely many terms, and you can rewrite this expression using a sum notation. I'm not going to do it in this video, but what I want to show you is the reason why I'm using a Taylor series here is I can actually answer the original question by setting a specifically to be centering the function sine of x at zero. So you're going to see in a bit how this can actually tell us if whether sine of x equals x. Okay, so the nice thing about a equals zero is this really simplifies the Taylor series notation above quite a bit. Everywhere you see an a, if you plug in a zero, now we get this simplified expression, right? You've got f of zero plus the first derivative function, which is f prime, evaluated at zero times simply x plus f double prime of zero times x squared all over two factorial and so on. You can take this for as many terms out as you want. The more terms you get, the more precision you get. So if you want to reduce your error, you're always better erring on the side of adding more terms. And what we want to do now is we want to specifically find the Taylor series for sine of x by finding just the first few terms to get an idea of what pattern it's establishing. And more importantly, to answer the question I promised I would answer for this video. Okay, so for f of x equaling sine of x, the first thing you do is you evaluate it at a, which is zero in our case. So f of zero is going to be simply sine of zero, giving a result of zero. We move on by taking the derivative of sine of x, which will give us cosine of x. And when I plug in zero for that, I'm going to get one as my answer. And then yet again, we take the derivative. So the second derivative function will be negative sine of x. And plugging in zero simply gives you negative sine of zero. And we know that's zero as well. And then finally, I'll show you how to work out the next term here, which is going to be the third derivative of x. And that gives you a function that's negative cosine of x. And when you plug in zero for that, you get negative one. So the idea now to answer the question from this video is, I want to write out the first few terms of the Taylor series of sine of x that we can get by using these constants here. And to see if we can not only establish a pattern for what the general Taylor series looks like for sine of x, but more importantly, to answer the question in the video. And before I move on, do you want more ninja level math tricks? Then ninja kick that subscribe button. Check the description for awesome swag and to join the dojo. Members get early video access and more just in time to crush your next exam. So what I want to do now is take the results above and start plugging them in for this sine of x Taylor series centered at a equals zero. And that's going to give me zero as a first term because f of zero was simply zero plus one times x that came from the first derivative term. And then the next term after that will be zero times x squared all over two factorial. And you can take this out for however many terms you want. I'll go ahead and do it to the seventh power of x term. So simplifying everything, you'll get x minus x cubed over three factorial plus x to the fifth over five factorial minus x to the seventh over seven factorial and so on. So we already see a pattern here, right? The only non-zero terms had values where x was raised to an odd power, and the odd power matches the same number as the factorial you're dividing by. Okay, but now to answer the question, how does this tell us whether or not sine of x equals x? I want you to think about something. Think about when you evaluate limits, right? If you're evaluating a limit as x approaches zero, you tend to plug in values that are really close to zero, right? Like 0.0001, 0 0.000005, etc. If you go ahead and do that, even with this x cubed over three factorial term here, you're going to get something that's really close to zero. And more importantly, remember that for these decimals that are super small, when you raise them to a power of x, that makes them even smaller. And you can already see that very quickly when these powers are going up, these terms are essentially becoming negligible. And then now you're dividing them by a factorial that grows so quickly as well. So with that being said, 
for general approximations, we can safely say that all of these terms here, other than the first one, the x, are approximately going to be zero. And this expression itself is a good approximation